Hello and welcome to Esoterica. This is our first of many live interviews that I hope to host. A little bit of feedback here. Um, welcome, uh, Jonathan Papernick. So John is a senior writer in residence in the Department of Writing, Literature and Publishing at Emerson College in Boston, where he has taught since 2007. Uh, John is also the author of five novels, including, including his most recent book, I Am My Beloveds, which is due out in March. Uh, hello, Jonathan. How are you? Uh, I'm very good. Thanks for having me. I just do want to clarify so people don't think I'm more prolific than I am. Two of those books are story collections, uh, <laughs> but I'm not going to minimize story collections. Yeah. Please right. don't minimize story collections. They, no, they are think, five I think, books. I think they're know. awesome. I think they're awesome too, which is why I'm so glad to have you here for our inaugural show. So, uh, John, I, I just finished um, reading uh, your most recent novel, I Am My Beloveds. And um, I, I have to admit, I, and I have a little bit of brain fog during this pandemic, but I couldn't put it down. I mean, I, um, I think I read it off my, off my screen and it took me two days. Uh, so it was quite quick. Uh, so let's talk about that. Um, do you want to just give us a quick synopsis of the book? Uh, well, without well, giving away too much, but it's really a, a novel about a young couple uh, struggling to have a child and conceive, and as their relationship kind of falls into um, difficulties, um, the wife requests an open marriage, and the two of them end up finding other partners, and complications ensue. And uh, no, I, it's, it's, I'm glad you read it so quickly because I, I wrote the book for the purpose of it being read quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. My previous novel was a bit of a doorstopper and uh, you know, it, it took uh, a bit of a higher bar to engage with it. And this book, I just wanted it to almost uh, pass by as if you were watching a movie or something like that, mm -hmm. kind of more automatic in that way. Well, it certainly felt that way. So, I mean, there's a lot of interesting things uh, that come up in the novel. Uh, first, I'd like to maybe mention that the, the couple, um, so the main characters, uh, Ben and Shira, are, are Jewish. Um, and, um, I mean, let's talk a bit about that. It, there, there are very unconventional Jewish characters or Jewish couple. I mean, was, was that intentional? I mean, why make them Jewish? Well, I think uh, as a Jewish person myself, I, I see the world through a Jewish lens. And, uh, you know, I just think, you know, if I had to identify myself as anything, you know, American or Canadian, because I'm both a uh, mm -hmm. writer, I would put Jewish at the top. It's just kind of the way that I see the world, my worldview. All of my mm -hmm. writing has been through that filter. Um, so, you know, it, it's a way to kind of explore my own questions through uh, a surrogate, another character. Right. So, okay, and let's let's discuss Shira. So, I mean, the, the book is told from Ben's perspective, um, and he seems to be a very accommodating uh, husband, uh, probably ex exceptionally accommodating, and, and he tackles a lot of issues that, I mean, I'm going to just uh, generalize and say that they're largely uh, women's issues. So there's surrogacy. I mean, they're obviously joint issues, but women experience it quite frequently. Surrogacy, miscarriage, uh, you know, from... How did you find writing about those topics from a men's, from a male perspective? Um, that's a good question. It's weird. I think uh, when I sit down to write, uh, a different kind of process uh, occurs. You know, I, you would know that as a writer as well. It's like a door to your subconscious opens. And, uh, you know, some wiser person than myself, in my subconscious kind of whispers in my ear. So it's as if there's something in the back of my subconscious that's collating all of the experiences I've ever seen and putting it together through uh, this lens and these characters, right. um, you know, because uh, no, I'm, I'm not a woman, but obviously, um, you know, having, I have kids, I'm married now. I was married before uh, some of my closest friends are women. Mm -hmm. um, I don't find it any more difficult to write about another woman than I do about another man. It's just a matter of merging yourself or fusing yourself almost in a, um, almost in a meditative fashion, you know, you, you mm -hmm. become one with this character and they start speaking to you. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I don't know, you, you just start to work out things that you see. I mean, I, I know a lot of people that struggled with um, conceiving, you know, with my, uh, my kids, I have two children, children, but we had a couple, had a couple of intense miscarriages before that. So we were in that place where one might imagine 
what if this doesn't happen? What happened, what would happen next? So I did spend a fair amount of time in that limbo space, wondering whether we'd be, ever be able to have a kid. So I think I channeled a lot of that into there. Yeah, no, I, I mean, it comes across very, um, very gently and very, I mean, it's told very lovingly. So, I mean, it's, it's just interesting. I, they're not topics that I've seen regularly captured in fiction. Um, so to see it related to from a male perspective, I found really interesting. I, I don't, I, you know, never occurred to me how often men think about things like, like miscarriage and, and worry about things like surrogacy. Uh, so this was a really innovative, I think. Well, it, it was in many ways a response to some of my previous books. My other books have a fair amount of violence in them, uh, a mm -hmm. lot of uh, political violence dealing with uh, the Israeli and Palestinian conflict. Right. So I kind of made a conscious break to write something that would put me in a more pleasant place. Because if mm -hmm. you're writing a book for two or three years, years, years and you're constantly blowing people up, uh, it can be a little dark and it can affect, affect your ear. And I just wanted to try something different. I'm not... Uh, I didn't want to be a one note kind of writer who only writes about like the complex issues of Judaism. Uh, I, in this book, I wanted to have uh, more simplified Jewish issues that um, anybody can relate to without feeling they needed to go to yeshiva to understand. Right. Well, I mean, simplified Jewish issues. So, you know, what I found fascinating, and again, I mean, having grown up, um, as I, I believe you have, in, in somewhat of a conservative, you know, Jewish environment. Uh, so you have a couple and, um, you know, the uh, and Shira, the, the wife, is uh, is the daughter of a well-respected rabbi, but she initiates, um, you know, she instigates this polyamorous relationship with her husband and, and another woman. Um, I mean, not, you know, something I ever saw growing up, obviously. I mean, let's talk about that a bit. I, I mean, it is, is polyamory... Um, as a love story, is it is it entering the mainstream? Is this something that we should be talking about more? Absolutely, I think it is entering the mainstream. Um, when I was very young, when I was about twenty one, I actually did have two girlfriends. Girl briefly, I was, a, I was a bad boy. Uh, one of them knew, the new but I didn't. I didn't know that such a concept as polyamory existed at the time, or maybe I would have made a better case. Uh, you know, instead of being like, "Okay, you caught me," well, I, I mean, I didn't. She didn't catch me. I basically told her, and she walked away. Um, but that was 30 years ago. Um, and, you know, you know, at the end of my, my first marriage, um, you know, we had kind of an open situation where we were able to kind of, you know, see other people and meet other people. And, you know, it was done in a very kind of loving way to give each other the space to kind of explore other people, but still coming home to each other. Um, you know, I'm still really uh, good friends with my, with my first wife. We actually went up with my, with my wife, we actually went up to my ex-wife's parents' place for Thanksgiving over the weekend. And it was yeah. just, it was wonderful. So I think we, we did a really good job there. And, and I, you know, I spent a lot of my forties pretty lonely. I had young kids and, and, and it was hard to make friends, but when you're able to go out there and meet new people, I mean, I got to experience um, the world in a way that I hadn't. I met all kinds of new people and had some, some very some meaningful very relationships and some were, were brief, but interesting in their own right. Right. Um, um, I encountered a lot of people and there seems to be two kinds of groups of people. There, there are people that were like myself who were like trying to kind of salvage their marriage or try something out at the end. Uh, and, um, you know, they did that and then eventually they split and then ended up getting in a, another monogamous relationship. So there's that kind of group, but there are people, a lot of people out there that I met where that lifestyle really works for them. Uh, and it's a natural way to be, and it seems to be growing in, in popularity and, uh, mm -hmm. You know, I think there's a lot to say about that, uh, especially if you're able to handle it. Um, you know, and initially this book was written as an exploration of attachment theory. Um, that was where I started. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that from my background, I have a more anxiously attached style. And that was really brought out, um, you know, as I was meeting these new people and having feelings for them. Whereas I'd been married for over a decade where I didn't have that kind of anxiousness because I knew I was safe in that relationship. But if somebody that you have feelings for doesn't text you back and you literally don't know if they're ever going to text you back, it brings up a lot of old feelings. Um, so I wanted Ben to be, to be anxiously attached. And I kind of played that on with a trauma that happened in his life. I wanted his wife to share it, uh, share it to be more of a securely attached person, kind of a solid rock. And I wanted the woman that, that Ben met to be somebody that was a little bit more aloof and distant. And I think in, in her case, it was more situational rather than psychological. Um, mm -hmm. she, she was dating a married man, so that kept her at a little bit of a distance. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
that was what it started as really exploring uh, attachment styles through these characters. Mm -hmm. I can see that. I mean, there's actually one uh, really heartbreaking scene. Uh, I believe it's when um, it's before Ben has found someone, um, someone else. Um, and Shira comes home after spending the evening with her girlfriend whom she loves. And he could smell he could smell her girlfriend on her and, and he felt like there was this third person in, in their marriage. And it was very heartbreaking a little bit. So, I mean, the, I, I mean, it sounds like you presented the idea very um, lovingly, but it, I mean, there's, there's gotta be a lot of heartbreak there as well. Well, I think there is, I mean, again, I've, I've, I've met a lot of people that were in similar situations. Situation. A lot of the time when, when a husband and a wife, wife you know, decided to start a new relationship because things have become stale I think oftentimes the husband was very excited because he thought of all the possibilities. But a 40 something year old man who's married is much less appealing uh, to a lot of people. And a lot of, a lot of these men really struggle. I mean, I, I had my struggle struggle as well. I met a lot of really interesting people. Um, I ended up meeting my wife, um, but a lot of people struggled immensely. And I, I know a few people that ended up with just sitting at home on the couch while, while their partner went out and, and really explored. Uh, so mm -hmm. it could be and I had moments of that as well, uh, I'll admit. But, um, you know, I think, I think uh, you know, my wife at the time, we really kind of worked it out uh, as sensitively as we could. Of course, we made mistakes, um, but we both admit to them. And I think that's helpful. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, so it's interesting. I, I, I traditionally, what, what strikes at the, as at the beginning as a traditional Jewish couple engages in a polyamorous relationship and i mean it's not just one other person like there's you know the subsequent people i mean it kind of goes on infinitely those people have other relationships with other people and it, it, kind of, it, it becomes all encompassing uh, i mean do you, do you think you're breaking some stereotypes about jews or jewish couples here no i don't think so um you know i, I said that the initial impetus of the novel was not explore attachment styles, but there was another uh, uh, idea here. I, I worked with my former editor, Michelle Kaplan, on this book. She worked on my novel, The Book of Stone, and she was really kind of helpful in bringing out the best in me. Mm -hmm. And we had a discussion about uh, one of my favorite novels, Enemies of Love Story by Isaac Bashiva Singer. Oh, I love that which, one. In which the main character, there, it's, it's interesting, it's in New York City in the 1940s, completely made up of Holocaust survivors. I don't think you ever see a non-Jew in that book. Um, and this character is married to three different women. And so I wanted to, or uh, I wanted to write a book that a generation ago would have been an affair book, a book about affairs that is now not. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think, I think uh, Jewish people have the same uh, desires as anybody else. And uh, I've actually spoken to um, a friend of mine who uh, was talking about this Orthodox Jewish community. And these people are, in my book, are very kind of reformed Jewish or, or right. you know, pretty, 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 pretty assimilated. But, you know, you know, people swapping people lives in this Orthodox, Orthodox community. So I think it is a thing that's not really talked about. Uh -huh. uh, a lot of people are very comfortable talking about sexuality. Um, and uh, I wanted this book to be something that was uh, a friendly and human uh, insight into this relationship. Um, that was really one of my goals to write a fast-paced book. Um, you know, I just got a really nice uh, quote from Dara Horn today. It was one of my favorite writers. Oh, she, congratulations. Wow. Yeah, she described it as being like uh, uh, the fast pace of a telenovela, but with really textured and human characters. Mm -hmm. And I think that really kind of nails it. I was trying to write kind of uh, chick lit for guys. <laughs> not, not, not saying that women wouldn't read it, but I know yeah. that, that, that the readership is uh, heavily tilted towards women. And I wanted to write a book where, um, you know, it wasn't this kind of macho kind of book, but something that, you know, a right. book group kind of book, something that people can fall in love with the characters and, and relate to. Uh, there, there's no violence in the book, uh, no one dies. And uh, it was amazingly liberating to be able to do that. Because uh, as I tell my creative writing students that killing off your characters can be a crutch of sorts. It's like, it's like if there's violence, violence, violence things happening, happen. but is there really that, really that there's there's violence in real life as there is in the stories we read, we read. and we're really in a screen of mm -hmm. Turns out we might actually be in a world that's screwed up. But you're probably right. Well, uh, yeah, actually, that's very interesting. Um, Chiclet for guys. I think that is a genre that uh, really needs to be explored. So I, I'm hoping you coin it. Um, now, let, let's discuss uh, the title for a second, because it is it is a, a common uh, Jewish phrase. Yep. Um, I am my beloved. So I, I don't know if, if, if everyone, perhaps it is common knowledge. Do you want to talk about it a bit? Explain the title. 
maybe you could explain it. You're a little more, uh, you could probably say it in, in Hebrew better than I can. So maybe, uh, I, I can say um, it. Yeah. So, I, I mean, it, it is part of the, I believe it is part of the marriage vows. It's definitely part of the ketubah. It's from um, the Song of Songs. Right. And it's, it is a reference to the so a Song of Song, Songs or Song of Songs? Song of Songs by King Solomon or whoever by wrote King it. Solomon. David. So, one of them wrote it. it one of the it, kings. Yeah. It's one of my favorite lines, actually. Anila Dodi, Vidodi Li. And it, it, it's, um, you know, there's different interpretations from what I, I understand of the title, whether it's referred to a, you know, it sounds like a, a sexual relationship, but uh, I think it, it in its origin, it was meant as a relationship with him, uh, the humans and God and the divine. So yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yes. in this book, the main character, Kara, she has her own little Judaic business. So she does marriage contracts, ketubahs, and things like that. So that's the appropriate line for that. But I, 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 I uh, uh, took out the apostrophe here. So it's not, mm -hmm. I belong to my beloved, but I literally am my beloved. So that my main character, Ben, basically is his wife and his partner because he's so identified with them in large part because of his anxious attachment style. Hmm. He's so uh, connected with them because of that. So if they suffer, he suffers. Interesting. If I was wondering about the comma. I was going to ask you about that. And I now, and now you've answered my question. Okay. You know, the, the apostrophe is, 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 or the apostrophe is, rather. Yeah. yeah. No, it's a nice way to kind of switch things around. And actually I've got to come up with some reader group questions uh, today. Actually, my publisher wants them. So I think I'll t say something about the, switch of the apostrophe and how that changes um, changes things. I think that would be a good question. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it really it was a book was about this one character. He is his philosophy. You know, he identifies that much with him. So that was that. Was, that was the hmm, it's, no, it's, it's, I, you know what, I, I meant to ask you about that. So now um, I'm going to tackle that. So, I mean, let's talk about writing. I know, I know you try to um, maybe dismiss some of your earlier work. I, I hope you didn't, but you know, you're the, the author of five books, uh, collections of short stories. Um, you have uh, a couple other books coming out, I think in the near future as well. Yeah, I've got a short story collection coming out end of next year and, and I'm working on a sequel to I Am My Beloved. So uh, hopefully uh, that'll get finished. I'm so busy during my semester teaching that I have very little time to focus on it, but uh, I'm about a third of the way through the first uh, draft. Uh, the right. whole first act is done. so. Maybe it's like getting to the top of a hill and you can just push down and it'll take care of itself. Sometimes that happens. Yeah. Sometimes it doesn't. So so tell me a little bit. You, I mean, you, you've you taught since 2007. You see a lot of writers, a lot of people struggling. I mean, how is how has writing has writing changed since you started teaching? I mean, has, has have the styles changed? Has the theory around it changed? Like, what, what do you see happening? Well, uh, I've been teaching, I've been teaching since 2000. I've been teaching at the same institution since 2007. But uh, there's a couple of ways to look at it. My student writing has definitely changed. Um, I think, you know, I teach at Emerson, which has a very LGBTQIA, you know, positive community. So I've seen a lot more uh, stories about that community. But it's in the last two years, it's become really different that I'm starting to see a lot more of those stories that are not about trauma. It's just about people in that um you know, having their relationships in their life. And that's really refreshing because right. a long time, whenever you'd see, you know, a gay character, it was always about the trauma that happened to them. So it's nice to see, you know, it's an ordinary love story between two men or two women. So I'm seeing that uh, in my classes, I'm seeing a lot of pretty effective use of the second person, mm -hmm. uh, which I didn't see for the first 10 years of my teaching, but I'm seeing a lot of it now. Um, as far as the publishing world, I, I don't know. I've switched what I read. Uh, mm -hmm. I used to be a major literary snob. Yeah. And now I'm reading a lot of genre stuff because I'm teaching a couple um, genre classes mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just loving it. Um, so I can't really speak to what's changed there. I will say that, um, you know, as far as uh, diverse voices, we're starting to see a lot more diverse voices being pushed out into the world. And I think it's very positive. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of ways to go. Um, but it's, it's nice to be able to read, you know, you know stories from less Latin, Latin characters or trans characters or what have you. And I'm seeing a lot of those. And, and you know, at its heart, a novel is about human beings and human relationships. So if they're well-written, they're equally as compelling. Okay. I think you need to be of a certain community to appreciate it. I mean, I've, I've read stories about all kinds of people, and, and they've broken my heart just as if it was written about, you know, my neighbor. So right. that's what I've noticed. Again, I'm a little less authoritative on what's happening in the publishing world. But certainly as a teacher, I'm seeing... Um, you know, a lot more comfort writing about uh, LGBTQ and, and, and trans uh, trans characters as well. I'm seeing a lot mm -hmm. of that as well. 
Yeah, you certainly, I mean, that's certainly something I've noticed just from uh, mass media, you know, Netflix, everything. I mean, it's, it's, there's definitely been a switch, which of course is a welcome switch. Uh, and I guess now we can add uh, polyamory because I mean, yours is the first novel, a uh, love story about, you know, a polyamorous relationship that I've read. So. Well, yeah, talking about Netflix, I have, I have an, uh, an agent who's, who's hoping to sell the rights to this for a, for a streaming series, because I think, I think the first book is definitely season one, a 10 episode, episode series. I kind of talked about that with, I have heard how it would come off, and uh, you know the second book would, would be a very good second season. I think it, it would it would work very well as a series, as a series because um, you know there's a lot of mini conflicts within each chapter. It's very similar yeah. the way it's written, uh, very likable uh, characters, and really meaty roles for for women characters here. Right. Um, so you know, uh, if, again, the word is out. Uh, we're yeah. looking to find uh, the right <laughs> producer to, to to take this on. Um, okay, well, we're going to share that in our social channels afterwards, and uh, you know, let's let's get that accomplished because I I, I can see yeah, it now I, that you put it out there. I can see it. Yeah, I had a couple of really good meetings in the fall, and there there was one um, you know developmental person who was really interested in it, but uh, it kind of clashed with some of the other stuff they were um, going to be acquiring, so it didn't happen. But she mm -hmm. she loved it. She she read it exactly the way that I'd want a TV person to read it. So that was mm -hmm. good. So I think it's just a matter of getting in front of the right people. And the book uh, isn't even out for three months, so right. we still have, we still have uh, some lead time with this. Not that it can't happen later, but uh, it's out in three months. Um, so there's that. I, 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 just, I, go back. I wasn't denigrating the writing for me, but I, I did want to say that because some people see short stories as different. But I, my first book was published 20 years ago, and uh, I still love the book. I think it still stands up, and, and, and we'll probably talk about this later when me and you met. But it was written about that year that. that that we were both living, both living in, in Jerusalem. So, okay, so uh, yeah, let's talk about that. Uh, so, uh, uh, so we met uh, what twenty? Yeah, twenty five years ago, right? Can you believe yeah, it, or something like that, which seems like an, a long time. I mean, I, I I guess that it seems like a really long time ago. Um, and we recently reconnected um, via a Facebook suggestion, which was just bizarre because I, I don't think I've ever stopped thinking about you. And, and that year, uh, that time when we both lived in Jerusalem was, I guess, a very formative time in my life as well. Um, so, I mean, tell me about what were you doing back then, 25 years ago? So I had uh, recently graduated from uh, undergraduate and didn't know what I was doing with my life. And I sent a bunch of letters to various news organizations in Jerusalem saying, hey, I'd like to be a reporter. I didn't know what I was doing, but anyway. <laughs> and, uh, I don't think anyone knew what they were doing back then. Uh, and then I, I ended up getting a, a large grant from the Canada Arts Council uh, for some manuscript I was working on, you know, getting 86. But, but, you know, it was, it was a full set of manuscript in my, in my writing. And I was like, well, I can either be here in Toronto, where I used to live, doing nothing. Or I can go to Israel, and, and where every everything is, is interesting to me. So yeah. I went there, and I walked into the offices of United Press International, which is a wire service that I don't know if they exist anymore. I don't think um, they do actually. Yeah, they barely existed then, <laughs> uh, but they but they had once been a big deal. They they were once a really big deal in they the forties, sixties, seventies, even eighties. Um, and I walked in there, and uh, the bureau chief was from Toronto, and he remembered receiving my letter, and uh, he said, "Well, we might have an internship here." which pays, have you ever heard of a paid internship? Right. Uh, so they, they hired me for four months. I got 300 bucks a month to uh, not know what I was doing. Um, but, you know, I, I covered, uh, you know, two different national elections in the same country in the same year. There was the Palestinian election happened in, in April in Bank, Bank. and then, in, in, I'm sorry, in January, and then in April, the election went, uh, BB, 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 BB was elected the first time. First time. So, mm -hmm. so I got to experience that, that. I don't know that I learned much about reporting, but I certainly took in everything that I could. And I've always seen the world through the eyes of me telling it as a novelist. So I was just kind of, you know, just drinking in all the details around me. Uh, and I found that that year in, in, in Jerusalem was such a great education because there only seemed to be three things that people talked about. It was politics, religion, and uh, history. And right. so I was able to get a really good education. And within a year there, I felt I'd come up with enough expertise to write an authoritative short story collection. Mm -hmm. And when that came out 20 years ago, it got a full page review in the New York Times. Um, Mordecai Richler's son uh, reviewed it. Um, right. It got some really good reviews and it was taught in a bunch of colleges. And it may or may not still be in print today. I thought it was, but when I looked today, because I just met an Israeli who wanted to buy it, it may not be, but we'll see. Um, right. 
but it's, it, it still stands up 20 years later. Um, it was, a, it was a formative year in my life. I mean, I really felt like, uh, I was really part of history, part of the world. I met amazing people there. Uh, I made a lot of good friends in that short period of time, there, including you. Uh, uh, I just love this. Uh, uh, I'm hoping to go back next fall because we're sending my, we're looking to send my son to school in Israel for a semester, and wow. he, I'm hoping to find a way to get there for a lengthier period of time. Well, that would be exciting. I mean, it, it's interesting. I actually, um, I was there a few years ago, and and I even walked by my uh, old apartment. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if you remember it, but it was, it, it did definitely take me back. So um, that was definitely a, a, a very intensive time. And I remember the Netanyahu elections very well. Um, I was working at the Jerusalem Report, also as an intern, also as a paid internship. Yes, unheard of, um, you know, and you got to do some really wild things there. So it was, um, it was, it was very formative. I mean, I went on to become a journalist for many years, but uh, that year. That was, that was your stated goal, right? Right. That's true. Actually, my, that was my goal to become a journalist. And I did. My stated goal was always to be a novelist. But I right. figured, well, I could try journalism at the time. I figured they would be <laughs> Dabble. Journalism, but they, they don't really, you know. Um, but it's funny. I went back also and looked at the two apartments that I lived in. And one yeah. of them, uh, six, 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 King George Street, which is a used books, books downstairs now. And it's, right. It's cool. It the is other, very cool. Uh, was across the street from where there was a suicide bombing. Later, right. uh, the was it aroma or moment? One the aroma. Of those I remember the aroma. Yes, I remember that very well. Yeah, I it was that. right across the street from where I lived. So I wasn't there at the time, but uh, but there were a number of suicide bombings uh, when we were in Jerusalem. Two of them were on the bus 18 route that I yeah. took to go to my girlfriend's place. Right. So uh, you know. Um, it was it was pretty intense, and I wrote a short story in my first collection called "Lucky 18 about about that bus and mm -hmm. a couple of, um, you know North American characters kind of hanging around. So you know, it, it was very formative, not just for that first book, but for meeting interesting people and realizing that there's more to the world than just you know my hipster neighborhood where I was living. So true, actually. No, it, it was definitely a window into the world for sure. Wow. Well, this has been uh, great and it's been lovely catching up with you. So thank you so much for your time and thank you for trying out our inaugural live video uh, with Esoterica. This has been, uh, you know, thank, thank, you know, just thinking about your stars that it worked out well. Um, and I'd love to have you back maybe before the book comes out or after the book comes out. Absolutely. Talk about it. Uh, but I, I do want to say that, yeah, I love it is, uh, Coming out, but yeah. it is available for pre-order. Get it on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or your favorite independent bookstore, um, and uh, hopefully we'll see it. Uh, you know, coming to a small screen to you in the future as well. I, I hope so too. And yes, I have pre-ordered it, so I advise everyone to pre-order if they can, and uh, and you will not uh, be disappointed. It is a great read. I think you you're going to be publishing a chapter of it. Uh, in, in, uh, I will correct. be. That's right. Esoteric will be publishing a chapter uh, probably before the end of the year. So we'll be promoting that. And so everyone can get a sneak preview. And um, then we'll be promoting this video. And uh, people can uh, see, actually read what, uh, get a little taste of the book before they buy it. And I, I do have, someone's been recording the audio book. I have that chapter recorded. I wonder if I can get the permission to, to use that as well, to attach the, the audio link. I don't know who I would talk to about that, but I'm sure right. I can figure it out. Not All right, well, let's right. definitely chat about that. That would be great. Absolutely. Very good. So thank you so much. Okay, thank you. And I want to thank everyone who tuned in. And uh, just as a, as a quick aside, we'll uh, hopefully be making these uh, live videos more often. Uh, the idea is to make them every week. And uh, so tune in to esotericamag.com. It'll be on YouTube and Facebook and a whole bunch of other places. Uh, and on top of that, uh, we do have merchandise that we will be selling. So if you I'm wearing our new Esoterica t-shirt. Uh, so if you want to, if you can see it, got to get the angle right. If you want to buy a new Esoterica t-shirt, uh, it'll be on the website and uh, there'll be instructions there. So thanks again, everyone. And we'll be speaking to you soon. Bye-bye.